Was, uh, more and more updates on uh, how other people have actually been able to use uh, to utilize these government funds will be coming through. But now we want to exactly switch our conversation into what the week's main stories have been and a lot more that is happening in the country. Before we went to Joshua Kagoro, we definitely uh, were looking at uh, some of the stories that have come through. A march that police has clearly said do not try a Kenyan situation in Uganda because these are two different countries. It is not allowed, it should not be happening. But there were some members of parliament yesterday who were saying, why do you deter people uh, from expressing what they have to express? Just leave them go ahead and do that. But we also have conversations with regard to electoral reforms. Last week, I think these were also reignited by um, the commissioner of parliament, Matthias Mpuga, who said he's talking to various stakeholders uh, to be able to do this. But the government is saying, look, uh, the free and fairness of the election is not hinged on this electoral reforms particularly so it's not a do or die and yet the opposition has actually been pushing for them and a lot more i want to introduce to you my panel uh who you may already have a sneak peek about i do have on my immediate uh, right is uh, mr arias machivi serunjoji it's a pleasure to have you on the media round table good morning Thank you, Mildred. Good morning, viewers. Good morning to you. And, of course, I do have Kwezi Tabaro, not a new one, on the media roundtable. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Mildred. Uh, very good morning to you. Good morning. And uh, the man who sells happiness, like they say, since it's a Friday, we always think about <laughs> the things they sell. But please do not try it if you're on the steering wheel. Uh, Mr. Onapito Ekomolaita, very good morning to you. Good morning, Mildred, and good morning, viewers. Always a pleasure to have you. Uh, we expected to have Benson Ongom, but he is not feeling well, so um, he may not be able to join us, but we'll nevertheless continue with what is going on. Let's start off from um, the political angle, because currently the National Unity Platform is on a countrywide drive. The other day, the NRA, not too long ago, a few months back, the National Resistance Movement was doing a mass registration of their you know, the party members and supporters. It's the same thing that was launched by the Forum for Democratic Change. Basically, all the political parties trying to set up for 2026. But one thing that has stayed for sure has been the call for electoral reforms from the political opposition, which now government says it's not a do or die. The election can still go on free and fair without this. Honor, I want to start with you because... I think from the time we had the Citizens Compact on Electoral Democracy at Total Africana, that was around 2012, 13 there. Um, the call for electoral reforms has continued, but we always have piecemeal reforms coming through towards each and every election, and then we forget about it after the elections. Do you think it's, um, we should go with what government says? Well, it, it, it is not all determined by the reforms. We can still go ahead with the election free and fair. Thank you. Uh, if I remember very well, the most notable reform ever was changing the name of, of the, the Electoral Commission to Independent. <laughs> I thought that should have solved all the problems. Because okay. if it was independent, or if it is independent, then there would be no issue. Mm. But I, I think the, this is one of those political songs in the country that have been sung. But it's as good as saying the NRM should leave power. Essentially, all the calls for reform would mean NRM leaving power. It would mean changing the way we know elections in Uganda to be. Because I think the most fundamental one is to say that uh, the Electoral Commission should be chosen by all, mm. the, all the contending <coughs> political groups. And I don't think that's something that we're about to see because... Uh, the, the people who have worked for the Electoral Commission have essentially been NRM people for all intents and purposes. They are known to have associated with NRM as members of parliament, as all kinds of... I mean, the current chairman was a judge. You certainly don't become a judge if you are not uh, politically correct. So to say, of course, you have to have read all the laws, but mm. you must be politically correct. So I, I think it's a redundant call on the side of the opposition because there is no way it's going to be granted. You know? There is always a false promise. I think the current Minister of Justice and uh, Constitutional Affairs, uh, Norbert Mao, had mm. always made it al almost his uh, career in politics to argue for reforms before yeah. he got into office. 
But since then, he has completely... <laughs> he's too busy, quiet. maybe. Maybe he's still on a honeymoon. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so I, I, don't, I think much as Mpuga wanted to divert attention from his uh, political battles mm. within NUP and maybe succeeded. So, but I don't see anything new. It's not feasible because there is no way NRM is going to leave what I know. It considers uh, a winning formula. If you have a commission that is doing a good job in your thinking, why would you want to change? Mm. So I think most of reforms normally happen in a situation of uh, equality in political contest, contestation. When you have uh, paralysis, in a, like you have had in some countries like Kenya, where there is no dominant political force, then you can have meaningful reforms. But in Uganda, the NRM can confidently say it enjoys majority support, and it's, uh, it has been given mandate by the voters to execute its agenda, its manifesto, and it, political reforms at the Electoral Commission, or any other reforms, are not a priority for it. And now the elections are moving closer and closer, mm. so I don't expect any reforms to happen. Okay. No. Um, Kwezi, <clears throat> do you think these are redundant calls? Because like I said, it's a forever call. Every other time we're getting into an election, maybe two years or so towards the elections, we'll hear about the calls for reforms, which government has been a little bit adamant to address. The previous speakers were always saying we bring piecemeal you know, reforms. We want some holistic uh, kind of reform so we can be able to encompass everything. It's coming back again. Is it another past time? Well, it's a good thing we're going to talk about the march to parliament yes. on, on this show. Short of uh, something like that, that you know, shakes the foundations of our, of our core institutions, I don't think you can talk about uh, reform. Hmm. I remember I was in these very studios on election night, and I felt it looks then the NRM was, was, was going to win and President Yoram Seven was going to win, that the first order of business would be to first of all <laughs> reckon with what had just happened. We had had perhaps the most violent uh, uh, yeah, election in our mm. history. 54 Ugandans had been shot on the streets of our cities and there was no commission of inquiry. There is no uh, official acknowledgement, at least uh, on, on, on the part of the institutions that were involved, that those people who shot civilians in broad daylight were brought to book. Yeah. The president just apologized and said a few of there them were, were killed by stray bullets and said the others were, uh, were terrorists. Mm -hmm. So in such an environment with an incumbent who is, for now, seemingly unassailable, it's difficult to even you know, talk about um, reforms because I think one of the things the opposition should be focused on is or anyone uh, for that matter how are we going to conduct the next election because the violence in the in the last election started on the first day of nomination mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. candidate Bobby mm -hmm. Wine was uh, beaten almost blinded and that characterized the entire election cycle what are we doing what have we put in place to make sure that the same does not happen so it may not be necessarily electoral reforms, but it could be changes in uh, the conduct of uh, security agencies, for example. How do we hold them to account and things like that. So reform should be a much broader thing <coughs> than just uh, tinkering with a few laws here and there on how soon should you announce the election, how, uh, uh, who should do what and mm. what should uh, the ESC, uh, sorry, the <laughs> Independent Electoral Commission look like. So if there is... Uh, I know the, the, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission has said it's, it's, it's too late now to uh, do comprehensive reforms. The only window of opportunity that we have, which I think in Uganda's case is a bit difficult, is to have a Kenya scenario where um, citizens uh, outrightly Demand. Yeah, uh, step out and uh, push their voice and then the political actors uh, are forced to act. Otherwise, you'll end up with... Uh, what the government spokesperson said, look, we don't need reforms. We've always had free and fair elections. Mm. And I don't see how the NRM would be uh, affected by uh, either having the reforms or not having the reforms. The status quo still benefits them. And 
I don't think the opposition has galvanized enough support to, to put pressure on, on, uh, on the on NRM the government. Or, or, mm. or government to, to do anything about uh, the reforms. Areas, is it just too late or there's just no will to have these reforms to come through? And also someone would be thinking, why now, just a few years, two elections, why didn't we start having this kind of conversation after 2021? Thank you, Midred. You talk about will. Mm. Uh, why should Genom 7 have the will to change a formula that works for him? Uh, because it's experience shows that power cannot democratize itself and my colleagues have already said that and now what happens is uh, your seven just wins the elections the way the thing is set up and uh, owner has also said it that actually uh, the honorable poor guy is trying to run away from a few things it's uh, i mean it is also imperative that we sit here today to discuss something that he said in a press conference the mm. other day and we know that he actually also didn't mean it. Mm. He was tired of people talking about him all the time, uh, corruption, this, censure, and he thought the country needs to move forward and we are doing just, just that. Away from that, uh, even the wording, when you talk about electoral reforms mm. and then you're talking about a parliament co uh, with the composition that we know, that the ruling party decides whatever happens in parliament. You can only be talking about reform. You can only talk about revolution in Uganda. And Kweza has made the point. He has kept referring to Kenya and the Kenya situation. What's happening in Kenya is known to reform. It's revolution. It has to be radical. People have to come out and say, this must end. Until that happens, then you cannot say, that uh, the winning team is just going to consider and say, now we have the power, but now we can democratize ourselves and uh, give the other people an opportunity to, to change. Having said that, uh, I have also seen on the ground uh, moving around that there are certain things uh, that would like to, to be tinkered with. I listened to the Honorable Mpuga spelling out what he wishes to be changed, and that has been happening. These are the same songs that have been sung uh, throughout. But when you go closer, from my experience as a journalist, and now uh, I work with local people very closely, and you, see, you hear some of the things that they say, mm. they will actually accuse uh, different political players, even those who align with the opposition, who are members of the opposition of rigging everyone is finding an opportunity to rig the election. You are going to encounter uh, opposition uh, MPs actually bragging that, you know, it doesn't matter if I have the support or not, I am going to rig. One of the ways they do it, I don't know how to do it, is uh, you have to hire voters from different areas. Mm. So what I do, uh, <coughs> let's say I intend to be a member of parliament or in Butambala, so I go to Kampala, maybe a certain place, I'm targeting 1,000 people who are actually not indigenous to Butambala, who don't even live there, mm. but I have to get them onto the register, and on election night, or uh, the day before, I'll, bring, I'll ferry them into the constituency, they'll vote, so that they, can, they may neutralize uh, the, the opposition the, uh, the, and, yeah, and give the you more support. And give mm. you more support. Mm. So that happens, and uh, so when they are talking about things that can be tinkered with. We cannot be talking about reform or revolution now, but there are certain things that perhaps need to be discussed. Where should I vote from? Uh, let's say for, for MP or whatever. Should I be free to vote from anywhere? If the people in a certain locality discover that this person is on the voters' roll, but we don't know them in this place, should we let them vote? At all, and uh, but, I, but if you've not identified that during the voter cleaning, the voter register cleaning on polling day, it may be very hard for you. The voter do. register cleaning, because uh, what now I have been told, because uh, they are going to be members, uh, workers of the electoral commission. The electoral commission, the chairperson or the top leadership doesn't have to know about it, but you're going to have a constituency hmm. that will have these registrars at different levels, even up to sub county level this person will have the register and may have the final call. You have, 
the other people may, might already have done the cleaning, and then this person gets in a uh, hundred more people. So you find these people are already on the roll anyway, and on election day, they turn up. So what I have heard now, the people on the ground say, if that scenario happens again, <laughs> and I'm telling you, it has happened somewhere, and they say this one must not happen again. We will not allow anyone who comes from, uh, because you have to come and explain to us who is your parent, or mm. whatever, else. where yeah. do you live mm. for you to be able to, to vote, even if you are on the voter's roll. So there are, I think, certain things on the ground that can be discussed and people see how to go about it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Things that can be discussed uh, if they don't threaten a change power. of yeah, power. That's true. And I think they could be discussed. Things like? Uh, things like, uh, do we need a presidential election? Maybe that's one. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, oh, yeah? like just yeah. leave the you know that, whole that reform thing? should be is acceptable. <laughs> you say there is no, there might be no need for a presidential election mm. for this coming election. Yeah, this coming election. So what do we do? Just They've, transmute sure, with the same after status forty form? years. Who does not know <laughs> the record of the president? <laughs> do you have to? Mm. To repeat, <laughs> reminding people, yes. people what he has done or what he has not done, there is no need. And the outcome is a given for all intents and purposes. Mm. But there are more serious ones like, should uh, the result be determined by the Electoral Commission in any way for parliamentary level? Because now there is a new disease that is coming up whereby someone has, someone has been declared a winner in the district mm. and the EC declares a totally different has gazetted a different person. Mm. And now the talk is reserve all your money to take care of the electoral commission <laughs> because some people have got away with it. Mm. And that is quite frightening. And the question is, at least at district level, the agents have some line of sight of mm. the process. After that, you cannot do much. Yesterday I was talking to people who are participating in elections like myself before, and they say they got evidence that the results that they obtained as the constituency were not what the EC database was showing. In other words, there were attempts or readiness to, to give another person if they raised the necessary power. Mm. So, so this, those are real issues. At least at parliamentary level, there are things you can change. And of course, at presidential level, you mm. can also change and say there's no need for elections and save the country <laughs> a lot of money, save the country a lot of violence, you know, because people died and more are going to die unnecessarily, you know. Yeah. So <coughs> some of those reforms, of course, they have to be constitutional in nature, I think should be entertained. And it, may, it might help the country one way or the other. Okay. Yeah. Kwezi, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking at the preparation. If yeah. you're going to have a good meal, you need to put in a bit of time. You don't want mm. to have to, uh, you don't want to serve half-baked food or it's burnt because you didn't give it a lot of time. And I'm looking at... How much did it have to take the opposition to organize and garner as much support of the Ugandans, sensitize them enough to be able to get the, you know, the, the deserving support for these electoral reforms? Because it looks like there is a lot that is going on. We are talking about corruption. This one is being arrested. And then the, the, uh, the people who are making rounds in the country. And then there is electoral reforms. So are we organized enough, especially in the opposition? Is there that organization that will actually be able to push? these reforms to even come through. Mildred, you make the assumption that we're all interested in the same thing, in this case, a good meal. There are uh, those who are interested uh, to have it, I but I don't think so, and I, and I think we've, uh, especially us in the media, we've harangued the opposition uh, enough on this, that somehow they are not organized and all that. Mm. But look at what NUP has done in the last uh, few weeks, everywhere they've gone across the country. Um, they pay for venues to convene, they pay for radio programs, and they're not allowed to have the, the radio programs. So organization on it, or in and of itself is not enough. Mm. The, the <coughs> request to them has always been, don't convene on the streets, go to public places like Nambole and Kololo. Well, 
they applied to go to the Kololo ceremonial grounds. <laughs> there was a letter written yeah. the other day saying the grounds are not available for them. Mm. So you have a, a players or a player who does not have the goodwill. There are some actors within the NRM who would be very okay without an opposition. In the last election, uh, there are very many actors in, in, in the NRM or, the, or, or within government who looked at that entire exercise as an uprising they needed to quell. Mm. So it was in the rhetoric of the, of, of the president, these are terrorists, these are uh, foreign agents. It was in the rhetoric of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people in, in, in charge of security, the police and, and the other government agencies. So for as long as you have that kind of contestation where one side looks at the other as uh, the enemy, not the enemy in the sense that uh, you know, they're after something different, but enemy in the sense that they, their very existence threatens the existence of Uganda or the Ugandan state. You can't talk about the kinds of uh, uh, reforms that, uh, uh, that we're discussing. But for me also, the other fundamental thing, which I think the president has touched on recently in his addresses on, on corruption, I think we need to work very hard to see how we can shield our, especially parliamentarians, mm. from the pressures coming from the voters. Because it's these pressures that I think largely contribute to the, the current corruption cases we have where very many parliamentarians are implicated. But also it's, it, it's really a threat to our uh, national security where politicians now want to build watches and they're willing to do anything to, to, to uh, uh, amass as much wealth as possible in the shortest time so that they can be able in the case that Ona has cited, to buy off the EC or mm. to pay off voters and, and, and things like that or to erect huge mansions in their constituencies so that people can, uh, can recognize them and give them the vote. So, Basically, retirement package. Yeah, one of the reforms we might need to think about is, is it necessary that voters in Butambala should vote an MP who represents Butambala? Or should we be voting at a regional level, for example, where Butambala is one of the 10 constituencies in, let's, let's say, central, central Uganda or, or, uh, uh, or, or something like that, and we have 10 MPs where all of them are on the ballot, and then it's maybe the first five that make it into parliament, but find a way of uh, reducing that interaction uh, between uh, the voter and, uh, and, and, and the parliamentarian because I think in Uganda's case it has been counterproductive. The quality of parliamentarians has significantly reduced the quality of debate in the House. Parliamentarians spend most time not attending to parliamentary business but attending to the... <laughs> To, to very trivial concerns by their voters. And if they R don't do that, running the opponents... Away, running away from loan checks. <laughs> and if they don't do that, the opponents will, uh, uh, will step in and, and fill the void. And I don't think as a country we benefit from that kind of uh, uh, political contest. But also maybe it will help attract uh, more moderate voices into our politics. Because I think our public out there is uh, radicalized and... Uh, because of that radicalization, it's reflected also in their choice of, uh, in their choice of leaders. And uh, many people, uh, I'm, I'm happy that Michibi has made the bold step. Many people like him tend to stay away because, uh, you know, our politics is, uh, is, is quite radicalized. Okay. We'll be taking a very short break. And when we do return, I want to start from areas actually on what, what sort of reforms do we think we may need? Because there's been a lot of suggestions coming through. What works for Uganda? And just like you said, how do you expect the president to be able to, you know, accept something that will uh, disempower him or will take away the advantage that he does have? But let's come back shortly after this break.